So uh, uh, I'm Nick Stern. I'm a professor of economics at the LSE and chair of the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Um, we're extremely fortunate um, today to have Cass uh, Sunstein with us. Well, you obviously know we're fortunate because you've turned out in such uh, numbers. And um, Cass Sunstein's had a remarkable career. Um, he's a very distinguished lawyer, um, distinguished professor in the Chicago Law School, university professor in the Harvard Law School. He was a leading figure in the White House in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Um, he is famous um, not just for his law, he's famous for the intersection between law, policy, behavioral economics, some of that around the idea of a nudge, uh, or several nudges, or different kinds of nudges. And um, for us here in the UK, and it was particularly uh, sweet for me in many ways, is that um, we elected him, when I, during the time I was president of the British Academy, we elected uh, Cass as a fellow of the British Academy. Um, through election rules, which uh, I had nothing to do with, I should, uh, I should say. Um, I could go on about all the remarkable things that Cass has done, but I was really struck by one, um, and that he is uh, amongst the professional squash players in the world, ranked 418. Um, <laughs> is there anybody here who is ranked higher than... <laughs> well, there you are. You should be impressed. Um, notwithstanding how young he is and all his best squash playing is yet to come. Um, the, lastly, let me just check on one thing. How many people from the United States in the audience? Well, that's not too bad. Um, it could be more of you. You're really welcome. But the, <laughs> for you, I think you'll really want to buy his latest book, which is Impeachment, A Citizen's Guide. <laughs> So, Cass, it's, it's a tremendous pleasure for us to have you uh, with us today. Uh, we look forward very much to listening to you, and we hope, you know, perhaps for half an hour or so at the end, we do have, as always, to finish at, uh, at 8 o'clock, but at the end to have chance for some interchange. So, Cass, you're very welcome. Thank you. So uh, this is a thrill as well as an honor. Uh, thank you for coming, making sure I can see everybody's face. Do, should we go around the room, everybody say your name and your <laughs> and of what you, your childhood was like and what you're doing now? Should we do that? Uh, uh, let me give away the, uh, the secret inspirations for this presentation, which is about how people incorporate knowledge. So for the last years, I was living in New York with my wife, who was the US ambassador to the United Nations. Samantha Powers, her name. And we lived in the Waldorf Towers, which is where the ambassador resides. And as I would go down in the morning and come back at night, the nice concierge would say to me, good morning, Mr. Power. Good afternoon, Mr. Power. Good evening, Mr. Power. Now, I did not mind this very much maybe a little tiny bit. I didn't mind it very much, but the concierge became my friend. And I thought if he was my friend, he should know my name. So I said to him, uh, you know, my name actually is Cass, Cass Sunstein, and you can call me Cass or Mr. Sunstein, whatever you like, but that's my name. And he looked at me with great intensity and he said, that's amazing. <laughs> that's incredible you look exactly like Mr. Power. <laughs> and uh, that was interesting. So I think he was not irrational. He was a Bayesian updater. And given his priors, it was more likely that there were two identical men, maybe just starting to lose their hair, walking around his building, that was more likely than that Mr. Power was actually Cass Sunstein. That was inspiring to me, seeing his face, updating. 
The second inspiration is, if you'll forgive, from Star Wars. You know Star Wars? So, uh, okay, I wrote a book about Star Wars. I did. In the course of writing the book about Star Wars, I learned that George Lucas, the mastermind of Star Wars, was within, in a vehement debate with Lawrence Kasdan, also a great screenwriter, about what Return of the Jedi, the third film in release order, should contain in its plot. And Kasdan said, Luke Skywalker should die. And George Lucas said, Luke Skywalker isn't going to die. And then Kasdan said, well, Princess Leia should die. And George Lucas said, Princess Leia is not going to die. And then Lawrence Kasdan said, well, somebody should die. And Lucas said, that's not very nice. You don't go around killing people. And then Kasdan said, and he got very serious, he said, look, George, a work of art has more meaning and depth if you lose someone you love. It binds the work to the audience. Somebody has to die. To which Lucas responded, I don't like that and I don't believe that. Now I think those are precious words. They are uh, a fam family cousin to the Waldorf uh, Towers story. Lucas was not being a Bayesian. He was not updating given his priors. He was a motivated reasoner. He thought, I don't like it, and therefore I don't believe it. Notice in his sentence, not liking, preceded, and therefore motivated, not believing. OK, so this is going to be about uh, updating based on good news and bad news. And I'm going to focus on climate change and how severe the problem is, noticing that with respect to immigration, politicians, education, the housing market, hashtag Me Too, Brexit, and others, people are receiving information, good news and bad news, all the time. Before we get to public policy and climate change, let's do a little experiment in this room, shall we? How good looking do you think you are on a bounded scale of one to 10? We have a little neurological measure, courtesy of the organizers, so that what you are thinking in your mind is actually being recorded. <laughs> okay, I have some news. As you were walking in, there's a credible observer who actually ranked the looks, is this violating ethical something, <laughs> of, of everyone in the room? And that's you. Hooray? OK, now how good looking do you think you are having received that information? OK, so let's suppose you said you were a 6 on the scale of 1 to 10. That looks like a 9. Now what do you think? OK, let's do it again. OK, forget what I just said. Think to yourself, how good looking are you? I actually have some news. There's a credible observer who ranked you. That's you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now, how good looking do you think you are having received that information? Okay, here's a basic finding about human beings that people find good news more credible than bad news about their looks. That's to say that people update asymmetrically finding good news, they're actually a nine, more credible than bad news, they're actually a three. The good news, bad news effect was first established in 2011, which found that with respect to intelligence and looks, people were asymmetrical updaters, that they were more likely to alter their views on the basis of happy news than sad news. And note that this is not confirmation bias because people who don't think they're that good looking are still more moved by good news than by bad news. It's not confirmation bias. Okay, what's been found, and this is all background, is that the good news, bad news effect, and uh, Tali Sharat, my co-author who's at LSE, uh, is responsible for most of the work. Uh, the, with respect to the likelihood that you're gonna die before 80, the likelihood that you're going to get trapped in an elevator, the likelihood that you're going to get obesity or diabetes, the likelihood that you'll be vandalized. People find good news more credible than bad news. And notice, if you would, at the outset, it's not clear whether this is a Waldorf Tower story of Bayesian updating or whether it's a Star Wars story of motivated reasoning. 
Okay, uh, Tali Sharat's work shows that there's actually a neurological foundation for the good news, bad news effect, such that there's a part of the brain that's associated with greater change in belief, and that part of the brain is associated also with reduced change in belief with respect to bad news, suggesting that learning has a neural foundation such that you can improve people's tendency to incorporate bad news by disrupting a part of the brain. So the technical word we lawyers know is zap. If you zap a certain part of the brain, you will reduce people's uh, reluctance to update on the basis of bad news. Okay, what we're speaking here now in the context of looks is more aptly described as desirability bias than confirmation bias. That is, it looks like, probably, the uh, emotional valence of the information is relevant to how credible people find it. Okay, um, there is work involving the likelihood that voters thought in 2016 Trump or Clinton would be elected, which nicely separates confirmation bias and desirability bias. It turns out that Trump voters who thought their candidate was not going to win, but who wanted him to win, were more likely to find pro-Trump polls credible than anti-Trump polls. And Clinton voters showed exactly the same pattern. What determined their receptivity to information was not whether it fit with their priors, but whether it fit with what they wanted. Okay, I confess seeing this work on asymmetrical update, I found and continue to find electrifying. And what I'm going to describe to you right now is the current results of research that uh, Professor Sharrett and I have been involved in in the political domain with particular emphasis on climate change. Our first hypothesis, which deserves two exclamation points, just because it fits so much with what I'm describing, is that weak climate change believers, not skeptics, weak believers, are going to find good news more credible than bad news. Meaning, if you think it's gonna get warmer, but it's not gonna be so horrible, news suggesting it's really not gonna be horrible will be more persuasive than information suggesting <laughs> we're gonna burn up. And the reason that deserves a couple of exclamation points is that it would suggest uh, an account of what we're observing in many nations, including Europe and my country, in a way that maps perfectly onto the good news, bad news effect for mouse in the house, how good looking you are you, how smart are you. It's just a translation to the political domain of that asymmetry. The second hypothesis, which I hope you'll find intuitive, is, uh, a reversal of the finding just described, where the hypothesis that I think deserves two question marks because it's jarring, is that strong believers are going to update more with bad news. That they will find bad news more credible than good news. Now notice if both hypotheses are right, we will see with respect to climate change in an information rich environment, intense polarization as disparate groups find different information credible and thus shoot in different directions. Okay, here's the initial experiment. We took 302 people living in the United States and we first tried to develop an index of the intensity of their belief in climate change by asking do they think the Paris Agreement's a good idea? Do they think man-made climate change is occurring? And are you an environmentalist? As a result of people's answers to these questions, they were sorted, and now we have a lot more numbers in, than 300 into, and these are kind of ingenious names, strong, moderate, and weak believers. Those are our three terciles. And then we ask them, providing an anchor, many scientists think we'll go up to, let's say, somewhere north of two degrees centigrade, and then ask people what they think. And the numbers to translate into Fahrenheit is a mental operation. Don't worry about that too much. Just notice, if you would, that the weak believers think it's going to get warmer, 
somewhere over one degree Celsius. They do believe in climate change, the, the, the bottom tercile, but they're less worried than the top tercile who think it's going to be in excess of two, maybe around three. We gave an anchor, the six degrees Fahrenheit, to make sure that there'd be order rather than chaos in people's answers, and the anchor seemed to be impactful. But uh, whether that's a distortion, we can bracket, because the question is asymmetrical updating, not people's climate change predictions. OK. As stated, that is, there are three terciles, and where you are in the tercile determines how hot you think it's going to get. No one's going to publish that article, yes? That's too commonsensical. There's nothing interesting there. If there's something interesting, it's in the condition I'm about to describe. Half of our group was told to assume that prominent scientists had reassessed the science, and they think that it's not going to get that hot. We're going to get warmer, but not as hot as they thought, somewhere in the vicinity of one degree Celsius, plus or minus. In the bad news condition, participants are told to assume that in recent week, prominent scientists reassessed the evidence and thinks it's going to get really hot maybe four or five degrees, possibly six degrees Celsius. Now the question is, what do you predict people in the three tercils will do under the good news and bad news condition? And remember, if you were the hypotheses about asymmetrical updating of a mirror image kind. That's the prediction. OK, the weak believers in climate change were moved by the good news. Hearing that it's not going to get very hot, their estimate falls substantially. Not to zero, but falls in line with receptivity to the good news. Their belief is entirely unchanged by the bad news. Their estimate stayed constant. This is the how good looking are you, how intelligent are you study, perfectly transplanted to the domain of politics where people are impervious to the information that they look like that not extremely lovely bulldog, I think it was, but quite moved by the picture of, whoa, great looking. And the weak climate change believers are just like that. Now that is, in terms of, I think, social science, not that big a deal, though in terms of the politics of what, epistem political epistemology, it's pretty interesting. OK, the strong believers in climate change are, as hypothesized, the mirror image. They are really moved by bad news. Basically, hearing the new scientific information, their estimate shot up in the direction of, it's going to be really hot. They were moved by good news, but much less, less than half, which suggests that we are observing asymmetrical updating of a completely opposite kind among the top tercile and the bottom tercile. The moderate climate change believers, notably, showed no asymmetrical updating at all. They are equally moved by the good news and the bad news. OK, there's a little bit of cheating in the study I've just given you, which is that we gave the anchor of six degrees. And while we haven't put this in the working paper, so you're going to hear secret unpublished findings. We did run the experiment with a large group. And with respect to updating, even without the anchor, we get very close to exactly the same finding. Moderates are equally moved by good news and bad news. Strong are more responsive to bad news than good news. And weak, more responsive to good news than bad news. In the anchors away version, the weak show some movement from the bad news. Unlike in the other, they showed no movement at all, but it's really modest. OK, I want to no just notice that outside of the climate change context, if the mechanisms are generalizable, we should expect to see this a lot. And we have very recent data asking people who think a wall should be built between the United States and Mexico, how much crime do they think would be prevented by the wall? And then we presented half of them with good news, new expert findings, suggesting that, not sure what the valence good news is the right word, 
findings suggesting the wall is not going to help or finding the wall is going to help a ton. And they show precisely the same asymmetrical updating akin to that of the strong climate change believers, meaning they are essentially impervious to news suggesting that the wall is ineffectual. And they are much moved by information suggesting the wall is going to do a lot to prevent crime. So are you with me on the basic finding? It is a generalization of good news, bad news effects with respect to people's judgments about personal stuff, vulnerability to crime, vulnerability to disease, and their own capacities and looks. It maps on beautifully to political judgments with respect to climate change. In the case of low believers, in the case of high believers, it's a little more complicated. OK, let's take the Star Wars account first as the explanation for what's being observed. The idea is that for people with low belief scores, good news, it's not going to get that hot, is doubly welcome. It's welcome first because it's suggestive that they're right. Their views are being confirmed. It's desirable second because it's great news for the planet, suggesting that we don't have to worry so much about the problem. Bad news, by contrast, induces uh, sadness or despair and is also disconfirming, leading to no effect on belief updating. So this account suggests that for the low climate change believers, they are like George Lucas. I don't like that, and I don't believe that. Okay, That's the mechanism. For high climate change scores, this tale, I think, is more intriguing. Here's a pejorative way to say it, and I confess that I'm going against interest here because I am a high climate change believer. I'm in the top tier soil. Um, for them, the kind of uh, aggressive way to put it, they would rather believe that the planet is going to burn up than that they are fundamentally wrong. The motivated reasoning account is that good news causes dissonance. It suggests that they've been fundamentally wrong to be alarmed about the climate change problem. And that suggests that good news about a political issue can evoke such a negative reaction if and to the extent it threatens strongly held convictions and people's sense of their own identity and competence. Okay. The second account is Bayesian, and it's the Waldorf's tower, Waldorf Towers. That's amazing. That's incredible story. And I'm going to give the simplest version of this tale and avoid any arithmetic. I think the simplest version is the correct one. The idea here is that for low climate change believers, it may have nothing to do with motivation. They think it's going to get warm, sure. It's not going to get that warm. When they hear that it's going to get less warm than they think, scientists have suggested, they think, oh, that's uh, informative. I guess I overestimated how hot it's going to get. The scientists have shown that it's not so bad. That's perfectly rational updating. By contrast, on this account, the high climate change, the low climate change believers find information suggesting we're going to burn up is not credible. Who paid for those scientists? Are they environmental crazy people? That is uh, information that they can rationally discount, given their prior conviction that it's not going to get so hot. You understand the account? It's not to say that they are correct in their asymmetrical updating, but given their prior, it is a uh, rational judgment. The Bayesian account also works, and I think it works more naturally, for the high climate change believers, where the idea is that for a high climate change believer, if you get information suggesting the science suggests it's going to get terribly hot, that is um, credible and moving of your judgment. If you get information suggesting it's not going to get that hot, you think that, oh, the oil companies must have paid for that. And that need not be motivated. That might be rational updating, given your priors. OK, I'm wondering right now whether you all have an intuition that the motivated reasoning account or the rational updating account is the right one, whether it varies across groups. 
We've made preliminary efforts to tease them apart. We haven't gotten very far. The basic phenomenon and its importance do not depend on the underlying mechanism. Uh, my hunch is that motivated reasoning is the driver, but it's more than, it's no more than a hunch. Okay, the broader implication is that for many people, good news for their nation or for the world, in the form of an apparently credible judgment that things will be better than they think, will have more weight than bad news. And we are finding in our surveys uh, widespread evidence that the good news, bad news effect is dominant with respect to political judgment, which suggests that good news evidence is something they are positive about and find credible. Bad news is the opposite. But some groups find good news of exactly the same kinds have a negative emotional valence, in part because of people's desire to be vindicated, to see their actions and concerns affirmed rather than contradicted. Those people are invested in their attitudes, even if the implication is that things are getting awful. So for those people, bad news for the country or the world, it might involve the environment, it might involve immigration, it might involve Brexit, will therefore have more weight than good news. And if this is correct, then such polarization as we're observing with respect to climate change in some nations, and even in some nations that have less polarization than my own, there's polarization with respect to the severity of the problem and the immediacy and cost of the appropriate steps, uh, that this is an explanation. Note, it's not an echo chamber information cocoon explanation. So I've myself been tempted to explain polarization with respect to climate change by reference to people's information sources and the uh, uh, selectivity of what they are hearing. That is probably part of the picture, but the explanation given now does not depend on that at all. People can be living in the opposite of an echo chamber and still be subject to these effects of diametrically opposed kind with one tercel going in this direction and the other in that direction, either because of Bayesian updating or because of motivated reasoning. If the evidence involves one personal characteristics or future, good news is going to have generally particular weight. But if the evidence involves politics and law, not necessarily so. That's not good news, what I've just said, but it's likely to be true. Okay, I'm going to conclude with three speculations about paths forward. The best barely cited paper in behavioral science that I know. It's fairly recent, not so recent that it shouldn't be cited more than it is, has a very simple thesis, where the thesis is that people's conception of the solution to a problem will often determine their judgment about whether the problem exists and about its magnitude. So if you ask people blind whether they think climate change is a problem or anything under the sun is a problem, they will make a rapid judgment about what the implication is of a yes answer in terms of policy. And if the policy answer is one they despise, then it will shift their judgment about whether there's a problem in the first instance. If you tell people that the solution to the climate change problem is to increase significantly the price of electricity, then their likelihood of believing that the climate change problem is serious is much smaller than if people are find credible the statement, the solution to climate change problem is reliance on energy sources that are cleaner and not that more expensive and consistent with economic growth. The empirical finding is that solution aversion is often determinative of people's judgment about the existence and magnitude of a problem. That's one path forward. And having worked in the Obama White House, I saw in real time the kind of tenacity of judgments about likely solutions in the climate change area as decisive 
in determining people's beliefs about their answer to a purely scientific question. Is climate change a serious problem? Okay, the second path forward refers to two kinds of actors who can be convincing because of the nature of their history in a way that would confound the findings of the surveys I've told you about. That's a kind of uh, uh, bad sentence architecture. Did you get that? Did that make any sense? The basic idea is the uh, survey I told you about, it's very spare. All people were told is scientists think it's going to get much hotter or it's going to get much less hot than they had thought. There are two kinds of people who tend to be quite convincing in moving people who would be otherwise um, unlikely to update. One are surprising validators. The, there were three really ugly words in government that I learned. They deserve a place in hell. Hell is permeated by these words. The worst of the three is do out, which is not about bathrooms. It's about things you have to do after a meeting. What are the do outs? Terrible word. The second terrible word we've probably heard is deliverable, a product. That's awful. The third, and I confess my personal least favorite, is validator, where the idea is do you have a validator for initiative who will say the initiative is good? The best kinds of validators are surprising validators. And as I think intuition suggests, if there's someone who is a surprising validator of the uh, magnitude of the climate change problem, then movement is more likely than otherwise. An unsurprising validator is not going to create updating. Convert communicators are ones who say, I used to think this, and now I think that. And they have a kind of unearned, I think, credibility but there's something in the human mind that finds them uh, magnificently persuasive. I used to think like you do, not anymore, and here's why. Okay, the third path forward is the most controversial, I think, but uh, maybe the most promising. And that is uh, to emphasize the importance in any system committed to self-government of placing a lot of what? Um, epistemic authority in technocrats. There's a book out relatively recently which is about Sweden and Singapore, an odd couple, but the celebration of Sweden and Singapore in the author's hands is in while in both countries in his version, uh, public consultation is in the end critical and the people have large decision-making authority. The technocrats have a significant role in at least uh, uh, making judgments about fact. And the idea here would be in this country, in Europe generally, in the United States, not to make the technocrats the rulers, but to give them a large degree of authority in resolving technical questions, subject always to democratic uh, yeses and nos, is indispensable. And that the kind of 21st century version of the 18th century ideal of deliberative democracy um, uh, has some word that has an emotionally happier valence than technocrat and gives them uh, uh, a high degree of decisional relevance. And uh, this is true in the UK. I hope you're thinking of areas in the domain of climate itself where this has worked. I'll give you one from the United States. To determine whether to go forward with a regulation and determine its level of stringency, you need a social cost of carbon. That has to be done. The social cost of carbon could be any number of things, and there's great work which has a range of disagreement on what it should look like. The process in my country in the Obama administration that produced a, a social cost of carbon may or may not have been ideal, but it was uh, 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 immune from political interference. It was subject eventually to political yes or no, but the ingredients of the analysis were done by technocrats who had absolutely no interest in interest groups 
or re-election. Okay, the fact that technocratic democracy has been able to make in so many countries as much progress as it has on climate change in the face of asymmetrical updating of the sort I've described is really good news. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Cass. That, that was absolutely fascinating, and um, uh, it, it's hard stuff for academics to think about because you're tempted to start thinking about constructing what you say around the qualities and reactions of the people who might be listening, and that might be a dangerous road. Um, but let me stay out of it for a bit. Um, there must be lots of questions. Remember the LSE tradition of looking for gender balance in, in questions. Um, there are lots of other LSE traditions I won't go into. But the, um, the gentleman right at the back at the top. I'm, we're going to take three at a time, and then, Cass, if you could respond. Yes, on the climate change questions, um, um, could, could, could you say uh, who you are and uh, where, you know, uh, I'm yeah. a student or uh, whatever? Peter Sosu, based in CPNSS and the Grantham Research Institute. Um, on the climate change uh, questions, you described the different groups and their responses. Um, did you do any, uh, Rami, did you do any test to see what the, uh, uh, if they differed in their ability on reasoning, uh, other reasoning questions and so on? Fine, I say we'll take uh, three at a time. Uh, are there more? Is that lady just at the front upstairs? Hi, um, sorry. A, there's a mic. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm a LSE alumni and I work for Kingston Smith. Uh, my question is if, uh, you know, politics are not the solution, which I'm not saying it is, but if we don't get people in general and, and a majority of people to go for climate change and believe in sustainability, how can we motivate people to actually change their behaviors without imposing some form of more authoritarian government? Very large question. I'm sorry. It's OK. It's one from downstairs. This gentleman right at the front. Um, so uh, John Gibbons, University of Sheffield. Which do you think came first, people's belief in the, uh, or interest in the means to tackle climate change, or climate change itself? Because some people wanted things that come with tackling climate change before climate change was deemed an issue. Yeah, these are great questions, so <coughs> thank you all. So um, on the tercials and whether they dif differ in reasoning, it, it's a fantastic question. We did not test for that. Uh, there's other work that finds strikingly that people who don't believe in climate change do not reason less well and do not know less than people who believe in climate change. They just don't believe it. So that's noteworthy. It's tempting for some of us to think there must be some lack of information or information processing capacity. Uh, not so. Um, uh, with respect to politics as the solution, that uh, is not the solution. How can we motivate people to change their behavior? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm thinking of a few things. There's uh, a, a democratic government might think that um, regulatory measures, and let's call them emissions reductions requirements that could take the form of cap and trade or could take the form of um, a tax or which could take the form of just, you know, there have to be less emissions from automobiles or from trucks or from power plants. All those are good steps and th those could be uh, politically harmful for the politician to press that or for the president or the prime minister or they could be winners to press and they're all legitimately part of the uh, repertoire of things that are under consideration. So those are things that are uh, uh, are pretty aggressive instruments uh, in the abstract, uh, cap and trade or a tax may be properly aggressive. Uh, they aren't aimed at 
They aren't targeting in a very visible way individuals. But there are ways to target individuals. The word target is probably a little unkind because they're, you can see another bad word, empower. Isn't that a terror? Is that an American word, empower? I think so. Uh, it's, it's, you know what it means, empower. OK. So, uh, it, but there must be some good word for empower that isn't um, sentimental but also isn't too fussy. This is a task for us to come up with some word. But if people are given information about uh, economic and environmental savings for one or another step, that's a nudge. And that can be effective, and it's anything but authoritarian. So some countries have, for some products, information that bears on greenhouse gas emissions associated with the product. And people can pay attention to it or not. Um, there's interest in some nations in using default rules, so people are automatically enrolled in uh, climate-friendly, let's say, energy provision. But if it's more expensive, they can opt out. The evidence from Germany is that the impact of automatic enrollment in clean energy is massive. So you can get, you know, under an opt-in design, about 6.7% of people say OK. And under an opt-out design, about 67% of people stay in and they know they're staying in. So a default rule is not authoritarian, so long as people are giving uh, free, uh, free opt-out. So there's a range of things that uh, can be very impactful, or can be maybe less so, but somewhat impactful. And if the social cost of carbon is north of, let's say, uh, 25 pounds, even modestly impactful is, in economic terms, a pretty big deal. And some of this can be done privately, some by public institutions. And none of them counts as authoritarian. Okay, you ask a great question about means to tackle. Um, so what I'm pondering is whether the bottom tercile in our group are uh, very unhappy with what they perceive as the means to tackle the climate change problem. And that's really the driver of their judgment. Alternatively, whether some people, and surely this is true, who, who think we're, it's going to get really hot, they're kind of excited about the, um, what's the right word, the deindustrialization that climate change measures, in their view, might produce. And that's a driver of their judgment. It's an ethical or something prior that's determining their scientific uh, judgment. Uh, we know from the solution aversion, the less cited than it should be paper, uh, that that's a contributor. We don't know the, I, the magnitude of the contribution. I think from the normative point of view, oughtn't we to say a pox on both their houses? That is, the uh, judgment about the magnitude of the climate change problem ought not to be. It's a shame if, to the extent that it is infected by a uh, happy or sad judgment about the solution, which is a point for letting the technocrats, imperfect as they are, have at least a significant role in informing judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Cass. So we'll take three more questions. Um, there's a, a gentleman up there, just um, the, of the two, the one closer to the front. Thank you. Um, I'm Chris de Mayer. I'm a neuroscientist at King's College London. Um, the results you present are very interesting, but they are already sort of preempted by lots of cognitive dissonance experiments from the 1960s uh -oh. and the motivated reasoning experiments. I don't like that, and I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent answer. Um, so, of, of course, you've, you've done this in this different context, which confirms that the climate change context applies to those types of experiments that were done in the 60s and the 80s on dissonance and motivated reasoning. But what struck me when I read those papers from back in the day is that the distinction that you make between the uh, Bayesian belief updater and the uh, emotional stickiness of the motivated reasoning that the people who were investigating it in those days thought it was always a push and pull between the two. And therefore, 
I'm wondering if your question, like which one is it, whether it's not like it's probably both and the conditions under which there's more of the emotional stickiness and more of the rational belief of dating is what's the interesting question. Now, whether that then can be described in a Bayesian framework or not depends on what variables you put in your Bayesian model because you might well think of a Bayesian model that includes some emotional variables in which then it still turns out to be that the brain updates in a Bayesian or in a sense that can be described and in a Bayesian and way. Could you do the, the uh, ultimately your question is? So my question is like, does there need to be the distinction between the two or is it more that both of them could be valid under certain conditions? Thank you. The lady at the front. Hi, I'm Goodwin Gibbons. I study climate science at Imperial. Um, so I've got two questions. One easy, that solution aversion paper, can you give a reference for it so I could look it up? And um, secondly, if you know it, uh, coming from both the US and UK background, I'm wondering if you've thought about whether the motivational reasoning might be more or less strong between the two countries, if you have any thoughts about that, where the climate denial is not such a prevalent thing here. Thank you. Um, one more question this round. Is the lady right up the top there? Hi, um, I'm studying at uh, King's College London. Um, I was just kind of looking at like, thinking about um, your your kind of bad news, good news thing and, and the more kind of bigger picture of that. Um, and whether you think, uh, because we kind of b thinking about that, what are the implications of that in polarization? And if you think that is, is gonna kind of increase more polarization and maybe how the media might play into that because obviously, we te uh, media, media tends to um, want to interest a reader and whether that, that maybe would be kind of fed through there. And maybe if you have an idea about how you could combat that, to I don't know. Thank you. Kath. Okay, so on the cognitive dissonance literature, I, you know, Leon Fessinger is one of my heroes. Um, and the, I think the most evocative work that Festinger did actually is When Prophecy Fails, which is basically a narrative of dissonance reductions by religious believers in a kind of cult, and the prophecy didn't come true, and then what do they do in their own heads to suggest they were actually right? Uh, there's been progress since the 60s and 80s. So the 2011 Good News, Bad News article and Sherratt's work on uh, the neurological foundations of asymmetrical updating as well as the, the phenomenon of asymmetrical updating, I think are a, a huge advance over cognitive dissonance literature. It gives you a sense of the mechanism both in the head and in, uh, in ordinary political and, and individual life by which people become uh, uh, impervious to new information, and the notion of cognitive dissonance is cruder than the notion of asymmetrical updating, uh, I think. Uh, so so I give credit to LSE's own uh, Sharet uh, for improving there. On the idea that there's it's both Bayesian and motivated reasoning, uh, the simplest view is that it's an empirical question, which is the driver, and this is knowable. Um, we're trying to find out. You can try to capture people's moods as they're answering the questions and see if there's something happening in terms of their uh, sadness or happiness that would tell you something. Um, there might be something about using brain imaging to see if something's happening in the mind that involves emotional sectors uh, that would tell you something about that. Uh, uh, it's possible, so I agree with this, that you could have both, but I don't think it's helpful, and I don't think you were saying this, 
to, to say that the motivated reasoning account or desirability bias is Bayesian because that would collapse rational updating with what is it kind of second order rationality where you're monitoring your own happiness and adjusting your debates, your, your, your views accordingly, where you're thinking, I don't want to believe that, I don't want to be sad, therefore I'm not going to update. And that, that wouldn't be standard Bayesian, though it might be a second order, if you're with me, it'd be second order Bayesian of a kind of cra obsessive kind or you're self-monitoring your affective state all the time and changing your beliefs accordingly. So I think it's extremely helpful and kind of necessary to separate the two, noticing that for some people, both may, might be at work. Surely, okay, here's another, maybe it'll be a little more specific. Surely there are some high climate change believers who treated in our experiment the good news as uninformative, are like people who believe that dropped objects fall who aren't going to stop believing that if I tell you, you know what? I dropped my pen the other day and it didn't fall. They think, and they're not like George Lucas. They, their prior is suggesting that that's not good information. And that is certainly a partial explanation. But does, is that dominating our data? Are the strong climate change believers more Bayesian and the weak believers motivated reasoning? I think you'd have to be a motivated strong climate change believer to think that. <laughs> yes? Though it, it might turn out to be true. So we just don't know which is the driver. And they are separable explanations. Um, solution aversion. Uh, I'm blocking on the citation. One of the co-authors is from uh, uh, Notre Dame. If you put solution aversion, Google climate change in, I like to believe that it's going to come up. Uh, um, remind me what you said of motivated reasoning. Oh, fantastic. OK, I, I'm working on generalizing this. And it would be extremely interesting to know. Uh, notice that while the United States is famous for having a number of climate change deniers, our third tercile isn't climate change deniers. They believe it's going to get hotter, significantly hotter. So that's suggestive that the result will generalize. But we don't know. Uh, I'm trying to find out. I hope to have results within the next three or four months. On the media, that's, that's a terrific question. So the kind of crude answer is that uh, a media that is just randomly providing people with information as it comes across the transom is going to be providing good news and bad news about climate or an assortment of environmental problems. And uh, you're going to see asymmetrical updating of uh, very different kinds, which is going to breed polarization, regardless of whether the, the media is interested in interesting readers. The profit or eyeball motive is, is irrelevant, even if they just say, we're going to provide the information we see. Uh, if they're interested in interesting readers, then they're going to provide the most dramatic stuff, you know, that is going to, and that should heighten, heighten the effect. In terms of what to do in democratic polities, I guess there are two ways to go. One is to uh, find ways to increase the deliberative quality of media information provision. And a lot of people are working on that. Uh, and the other is to uh, have a kind of structure of government such that it isn't daily susceptible to swings that reflect asymmetrical updating. So th does, does the UK have a social cost of carbon? It, n no, it doesn't have, uh, not in the sense that, you know, Mike Greenstone is $35 a ton. It has a floor on the carbon tax, but it's, that's not an interpretation of the social cost of okay, carbon. Okay, so in principle, the tax should be equivalent to the social cost of carbon. And in principle, every regulatory decision should be informed by the social cost of carbon. Yes, there may be something wrong in what I just said, but it's not self-evident. So for a nation not to have a social cost of carbon, that's not something to be excited about. There should be one. 
it should not be determined by you know polling people who are busy what they think the number is. It should be a highly technical process, which is also subject uh, to public scrutiny. It might be that, and there would be, you know, under happy assumptions, there would be good wisdom of crowd reasons to suggest uh, if technocrats can't agree to have some kind of average of people who kind of know what they're doing. And that could generate a social cost of carbon. Once you have a social cost of carbon that is the foundation for at least some assortment of choices, this stuff is just background noise. So uh, in the country I know best, we have uh, fuel economy standards and energy efficiency standards and uh, an assortment of other regulatory requirements whose existence and stringency is a product of a social cost of carbon between $30 and $40, rather than zero and $5, or $100 and $200. That's just the generator. And that engine is not affected in the least by asymmetrical updating. It might be affected by uh, new information that suggests that the number is too low or too high. Could I, could I just intervene gently on the social cost of carbon? Um, first, I don't think it's only technocratic, because it does depend on intertemporal values. Um, the second is that if you um, ask the question, what should the carbon tax look like, it, in one version, and it no, I, 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 it wouldn't be one that I would radically campaign against for too long, but it would be a kind of calculation of the marginal social damage, um, bringing the, your, your best guesses at what might happen and uh, your intertemporal values together. Or, and I think this is what I would prefer, it would be asking the question, given that we've set a target, uh, a long-term target for very good reason based on the long-term destruction that something much over two degrees would bring. Um, we've answered the question, look, this is a really terrible place to go. Do you want to go there? And we've said absolutely not, with some knowledge of what the consequences of that answer is in terms of policies and so on. Then it, one version of the policy variable for the price of carbon is the price or sets of prices that would get you along the path the long-term solution. Now, in a perfectly um, organized, optimizing, optimizing system, like your friends in the Department of Economics, University of Chicago might model, those two prices would be the same. But in a complicated, difficult world full of all sorts of other uncertainties and difficulties, they wouldn't be. So um, whilst I support Mike Greenstone and his social cost of carbon and remind everybody that the number was far too low, because um, they underestimated the risks, um, uh, more and more I would tilt towards, here's a long-term strategy put together in, in a best guess, rational, looking at what might happen sort of way, but not the kind of detailed cost-benefit analysis that you really can't do in that. Terms, I think. Then I would go for that kind of pricing, but um, since, you, since you asked about or said that that's the right way to look at uh, the underlying driver of policy, I thought I'd just abuse the chair and differ a little bit. But you don't have to, it. Bob Ward. Hi, uh, Bob Ward from the Grantham Research Institute. So I was thinking about your lower tercile. Is it possible that what's driving their motivation is not about the size of the problem, but the manageability of the problem? And that there are two ways of dealing with the manageability. One is to assume that the problem is much smaller and therefore manageable. Or one is to, um, is to understand that the options for managing it are available. In which case, the solution for them is not necessarily to downplay the 
size of the problem, but to emphasize that things can be done about it. That seems to me to be a, I'm hoping that might be the answer because the downplaying the problem doesn't seem very attractive, but if, if the way forward with that group is to emphasize that the, ma the problem is manageable in some way, uh, that, that that's a good way of, of moving them towards action. Yeah, two more, two more questions. Is right up there on the, that side, please? Yes, that's you, yeah. Hello, yes, okay. Um, hi, my name is Sophie. I'm studying um, environmental policy and regulation here at LSE. Um, I had a question about um, the nudging strategies you were talking about, um, and I'm just wondering if you think that nudging strategies are the best way to achieve a more meaningful change in environmental behavior, just because it seems like from what I know of nudging in the Germany example you gave, the results have been quite narrow, and I feel like the solution requires maybe a more holistic change in, in, in beliefs, yeah. One more question. Gentleman just here. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Bluestone. I'm um, uh, in a master's program here at the LSE in public administration. Um, and I'm writing uh, my dissertation on, on a topic quite similar to this, so th thank you for uh, some inspiration. <laughs> um, so I, uh, in a previous life, I came uh, from working at the intersection of policy design and strategic communications, and so I think that this is relevant for what I used to do uh, as well. And so I would s what would you suggest for a policy professional who, say, might uh, venture into the 2020 campaign in the U.S. in terms of communicating um, during the election around climate change in order to uh, um, try to convince the, wide, the widest swath of people to vote for a non-climate skeptic? Okay. Uh, great. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a discussion that happened in the White House when I was there. The president, President Obama, was not involved in the discussion, but uh, people were discussing exactly that. And some of the communications people emphasized, you know, we should talk about all the green jobs and the innovation that will be spurred and the economic boon that greenhouse gas reducing policies will engineer. And one of the policy analysts in the room said to the communications person, oh, you mean that the wonderful things that will come from reducing greenhouse gases are so great that we would do them even if there wasn't a greenhouse gas problem. That was a devastating answer. Do you see why it's devastating? Because it suggested the communication strategy that emphasized the wonderful things, it's basically a lie or, or incomplete and probably not a great idea for a candidate or, can I say this? Probably a good idea for a candidate or a public official not to lie <laughs> or misleading, <laughs> it's prob probably good. So, uh, I, you know, I'm a lawyer and I worked on regulatory issues and I did work on the campaign, but not as a camp. I think as a, you know, you wanna tell the truth. And so the thing that to be said is, look, there are an assortment of strategies that are uh, not that costly and that are gonna deliver big benefits to <laughs> this country and the world, and here's what they look like. So, truth. And, uh, and then if there's a discussion, it might be a challenging discussion, but uh, okay, there's that. Uh, in terms of nudging strategies in the climate change area, uh, uh, okay, so it is true that the largest reducing uh, interventions will probably take the form of something other than a default rule or an inf information provision. So um, the Clean Power Plan in the United States is a very significant step toward reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the uh, restrictions imposed on automobiles for fuel economy purposes, they are huge greenhouse gas 
uh, reducers. Uh, nudges, not so much. But uh, for, for any problem, whether it's you know, a local problem in one's own life or a national or international problem, to, to diminish the uh, importance of something that is like a, a, a cut in the problem would be wrong. And the German result, in a, in a way it's narrow, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very important that if people are automatically enrolled in green energy, the participation rate jumps by a factor of 10. And if green energy is a lot cleaner in terms of greenhouse gases than dirty energy, then the reductions will be very significant. It could have the same effect as an emissions control approach. So uh, uh, the, the great English poet, uh, William Blake, wrote Marginalia to Sir Joshua Reynolds, in which you, know, you could tell him, uh, you could tell the artist and the poet is talking to the great neoclassical artist in a way that is very edgy. He says, to generalize is to be an idiot. To particularize is the alone distinction of true merit. I thank God I am not like Reynolds. And uh, you know, that's pretty strong stuff. And it's also kind of self-contradictory to generalize is to be an idiot. That's idiotic by its own standards. It's a generalization. But, but, uh, but, but Blake had a point. So to think what is the particular intervention, is it helpful? It might be complementary to a regulatory mandate. It might be the best you can do. And uh, you know, uh, go for something that's, that's good. Uh, in terms of the lower tercile, and um, no, I, I missed the third one. Remind me of the third one. That was Bob. Um, about the manageable solutions, if you show yes. that they're there, that might influence action yes. quite strongly. Yes. No, I, 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 I didn't miss this. So I, I got the question. So, uh, so the um, thank you for that. So uh, we have a very crude reading of our data. And it, it is, let's call it the block-headed reading, which is we ask people, how hot do you think it's going to be? And the third tercile thinks, I'm doing a rough translation, it's going to be 1.4 degrees hotter Celsius. And that's significant. Now, whether the driver of their belief has something to do with solutions or not, uh, our data is uninformative of that. I, I think it's kind of good enough for starters to think that's just their belief about the science. It's going to get hotter, but not a whole lot hotter. What's interesting about that group is not, I think, the hotter but not that hotter judgment, but it's imperviousness to scientific information suggesting, gosh, it's going to get a ton hotter. Complete imperviousness in our data and their great receptivity to information suggesting, you know, it's going to get even less hot than you think. And so whatever the uh, wellsprings of their belief it's going to get hotter but not that hot, the fact that they are highly receptive to information that's, let's say, directionally uh, consistent with their view and completely unreceptive to the opposite, that sure. is noteworthy. Now, how to handle them, uh, the convert communicators and uh, surprising validators are one route. We don't have a lot of data on that. There's a solution aversion paper which uh, is highly suggestive, but we don't know for sure. Uh, it's probably the case that the low, weak climate change believers, there's something about their self-understanding, their identity, that is uh, driving their judgments there. And if there's an identity congruent uh, uh, path toward addressing the climate change problem, uh, that, could be, that could be credible. Um, could, could, I, could I ask one question, which comes really from a discussion with somebody we were discussing earlier, Danny, Danny Kahneman, and about five, six years ago, I asked Danny for his guidance um, in the following sense. I said, look, we don't seem to be terribly good at getting these arguments across. I confess then I hadn't uh, got anywhere near understanding the kind of subtleties and difficulties you just articulated. But Danny went straight to the messenger. And in your presentation, 
of uh, I don't like it, I don't believe it, you did give examples of people who questioned the source of the evidence that it, you know, it was corrupt in, uh, in, in some way. And you also suggested that someone who'd changed their mind was more convincing. Um, I, I find that a little bit difficult to be sure about. Um, and there are other e examples, but Danny went straight into um, whether the person offering the argument is trusted. And he said religious leaders are particularly trusted. And uh, he said, go out and get the evangelical right and the pope. And um, <laughs> lo and behold, the pope came along, <laughs> a wonderful man that he is. Um, not sure about the evangelical right yet. Um, <laughs> But it, the point was, jokes aside, that he went straight for the trusted messenger. And if you look at the UK, I don't know if you've come across David Attenborough, uh, who is enormously trusted. Um, now, one of the reasons, because he looks like a trustworthy broke, bloke, but it, that doesn't totally beg the question, but it does a little bit. Um, and I think it's fair to say that if you look at the way that Attenborough has gradually, over time, come out more and more strongly on this issue. He looks like somebody who's seeing the evidence build. He's not a flipper, if you like, who suddenly says, you know, once I said this and now I saw that. And that a flipper looks unreliable, you know, that something came along and uh, I changed my mind. And it, you worry about the nature of the reasoning. So I was wondering whether there is a difference in communicator between those you trust on other dimensions, like the Pope, and then when he speaks on this one, you carry over some of that trust, and this notion of people who gradually weigh and build, and whether they're not more convincing than those who just flip. Okay, good. So uh, the trusted messenger idea is undoubtedly correct, but it is a little... Um, like saying opium makes people sleep because of its dormitive properties. So we, we, we need to disaggregate the ingredients of trust. So the um, convert communicator work suggests if you want to convince young people, let's suppose, not to use illegal drugs, if uh, someone who looks like me says don't do that, that's unlikely to be extremely effective. But if there's someone a few years older who said, look, I was where you were, and I took the wrong path, and I lived through hell, don't do what I did. That's, that's the nature of a convert communicator, and that type tends to be highly credible. A surprising validator would, the Pope is not a surprising validator. So this is a, a different uh, source of trustworthiness. So, you, so a convert communicator is trustworthy for a particular reason. They have a commonality with people that they can invoke to uh, switch. They're not flippers. It's just they've learned something. Mm -hmm. uh, a surprising validator would be someone from, let's say, uh, a large automobile company who says, uh, we're going to go electric and the cars are going to be better and they're going to be safer and they're not going to emit as many greenhouse gases and this is in consumers' interest as well as everybody else's. That is uh, not only solution relevant, it has credibility because you wouldn't expect uh, that. And so that's why uh, a surprising validator can be trustworthy. Now you're suggesting there can be someone who's trusted for some reason other than that that they just seem, what, what's the right word, an honest broker or something? Mm. And, and that, that is true. The risk for the honest broker, uh, as for the convert communicator, is they see their trustworthiness as they, uh, uh, as they push the unwelcome uh, uh, I idea. So the uh, trust is, as Paul Slovak, the great uh, psychologist of trust shows, is it's, it's hard to get and it's easy to lose. Mm. And so, but you're, you're right to say there's a category of people who are neither convert communicators nor surprising validators who just you know them as honest brokers. Thank you. We'll do one more round of 
that's three. You could eat, we want to go on for a very long time, and I'm suppressing all sorts of questions I'd love to ask, but um, that's a measure of how I, much I, you've I stimulated. There's memory, a lady here. I have this vague memory that I did, that, that, that 8 o'clock deadline isn't real. No, was, no we, we have to get out of the room. Uh, to, to, <laughs> But we've got we've got ten minutes ten minutes left. There are two ladies here, just one and uh, one there, and then that gentleman over there. That'll be it, I think. Um, hello, um, my name is Viola Hevert, and I'm a member at the law department here at the LSC. Um, and I have one question and one very quick comment. Uh, the question is: I was wondering whether, in running this experiment, whether you um, took into account processing time and whether you experimented with different processing time because, well, well, with me it often is the case that initially you reject what you don't like, but when, when you get a bit more time to think about it, etc., and in sort of the privacy of your own thought processes, you might actually come to a different conclusion. So I was wondering whether that was incalculated in, in the, the testing that was done. So that's the question. And the comment is just, well, congratulations on your squash prowess. That really <laughs> <laughs> Lady right behind you. Hi, my name is Shilpada Matthews, uh, Cambridge alumni, and I currently work in, uh, with Deloitte in consulting. Um, so a lot of the views we currently have about climate change are quite hypothetical, but for some parts of the world, the effects of climate change have started to become very real. Um, is there a difference between these two sets of populations in your research? And secondly, what does that mean for policy, given that for most people for whom um, the consequences of climate change are very real come from developing countries? Gentlemen, the scarf right over on the end there. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for your lecture and answering our questions. Uh, I'm uh, Rodrigo, I'm from Argentina, and my question is um, about diet and climate change. My question is, how would you influence food choices considering that uh, animal agriculture and animal products consumption is the leading cause of environmental destruction and a huge driver of climate change? And um, it's uh, very possible that, or well, scientific literature says that we cannot keep warming below two degrees Celsius if we don't drastically reduce animal product consumption. Thank you. Okay, these, these are also great questions. Um, uh, on processing time, uh, people had plenty of time, so this was all online without time constraints. I, I take your point that it would be quite interesting to see whether you get, I would predict, greater asymmetrical updating if people have uh, reduced processing time. And if that were true, that would be, uh, that might be supportive of the motivated reasoning account rather than the Bayesian account, but not clear. That's, that's interesting. Uh, people were not under time pressure which suggests asymmetrical updating is very powerful, even if people have plenty of time. Okay, on, uh, on uh, climate effects being real in uh, certain countries or more visible in certain countries, it's a great point and it would be very nice to test this. Uh, you would expect that in places where climate effects are all around you, everyone would be a strong uh, climate change believer, though, everyone couldn't be in the top tercile, uh, and it may be the experiment just wouldn't be interesting. But I'm going to raise one policy question, which the uh, suggestion about uh, having a long-term target and a two degree Celsius um, limit, it's kind of doubly relevant to. So this is something on which uh, maybe some people here can do work, which is, Ought a nation which is using a social cost of carbon uh, to use the global or domestic measure? Yeah. Um, the United States chose to use the global measure, which is why it's, it was until Trump in the vicinity of 40. Under President Trump, it's proposed in the vicinity of two, two to three or four, and, and that's not only because of a dis higher discount rate, but it's driven mostly by the domestic measure. 
Now, to figure out whether to use the global or domestic issue measure is, uh, that's a very worthwhile project, and I think harder than it seems. On one view, using the global measure is ethically required on kind of uh, utilitarian grounds. But it's not clear that any nation uh, should be a global utilitarian with respect to domestic policy. And if, if it shouldn't be, then what makes this special? That's, that's a fair question. There's another view that any nation ought to be using the global measure because uh, if it doesn't, we're going to have a prisoner's dilemma in which every country uses the domestic measure and that's, in the, uh, that's destructive because every nation will be a loser. And use of the global measure is therefore a solution to the prisoner's dilemma. The problem is if any particular nation uses the global measure, it doesn't guarantee universal use of the global measure. It just increases by some probability the likelihood that other nations will use the global measure. And what is that? And I think there's, what is that increment? And, and then things are, I think, I think that the arithmetic starts to unravel once you think about that, and it becomes a conceptually very messy question. So global versus domestic is a philosophical and economic challenge to, to think that through. Uh, the two degree question is a little like uh, the suggestion that we should kind of back out the carbon tax from our global uh, goal. And I worry about both of those, and I'll, I'll tell you why. This will be familiar to the gentleman on my left uh, and who would have a superb answer and probably familiar to many of you. But I'll, I'll, I'll put out the, 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 the concern, which is a two degree uh, Celsius ceiling. Where does that come from exactly? Or whatever uh, end you've projected, where does that come from? And I think as the statement suggested, it will come out ideally from some assessment of costs and benefits. That's what it has to come from. And is that a, a stab in the dark? Hope not. If it's not a stab in the dark, it's going to be exactly the same as the marginal cost of a ton of carbon emissions, as stated. And if it's not the same, what advantage does it have? It seems to be the specification of the thing from which you're backing out is extremely conjectural. Is it more conjectural than using the integrated assessment models to produce a social cost of carbon? Not obviously offhand, it's at least as conjectural. How would we know what the, the two degree Celsius or something else is? Now it might be that policy analysis is not quantitative cost benefit analysis and it, whatever your uh, projected end in is kind of a rough and ready political motivator that's as good as anything else on analytic grounds. But uh, there's reason, I think, to be concerned about anything like two degrees Celsius is what is generating that number. Okay. On diet, I would defer to those who have expertise. Uh, the method probably should be one which is uh, very attuned to the uh, uh, climate uh, adverse effects of certain food choices and which tries something like um, replicating uh, internalization of those costs on food choosers. Now, of course, some of the choices that are greenhouse gas problems are also for health or other reasons, other environmental reasons, uh, environmental problems, which would suggest uh, you know, there could be a happy coalition moving in the direction you suggest. Thank you, thank you, Cass. Um, we've had a wonderful um, hour and a half. Um, it, it's, oh, oh, by the way, on, on the very last question, I'm not gonna try and answer it here, but I, I will send you a copy of my book, Why Are We Waiting, which uh, I think does answer that question, <laughs> and some other ones. But um, Cass, it, it's just been tremendous, and you know, this is deep, difficult, really deep, difficult stuff, but, you made it fascinating, and we know it's important, and you expressed it in a really elegant way, and it was just a privilege to be here. So thank you very much. Thank you.